Hi everyone and welcome to the Clinical Conundrum Series. This is Hisham Ibrahim, I'm one of the Emergency Medicine Consultants in United Kingdom and today we are going to continue with the second part of our discussion regarding the complicated chest pain patient that I've seen a few years ago. Before we make a start, I'd like to announce here about this course, From Zero to Hero in Acute Coronary Syndrome ECG. So this is a new course that is available online now that includes 14 different modules, over 10 hours of ECG videos with regular assessment after each uh, video that covers almost all what I know about acute coronary syndrome ECGs. I think it's full of fun and I think it's gonna be really useful. There'll be a link to the course in the show notes of this video, so please check it out and see what you think and I'll be really keen to hear your feedback about it. The second and the last announcement here is going to be about our normal emergency physicians ECG course. Uh, the next one is going to be on the 3rd of March 2022. So uh, this is a one day virtual course uh, that is full of ECG fun and it would be great to see all of you there. Okay, no further delays. Let's move on and carry on our discussion. And again, we're going to reinforce the golden rule. You will never see what you don't know. So. I made a big mistake and I decided to cherry pick an easy case uh, that day and my decision was young male with chest pain that should be easy. So I went to see this patient who was a 23 year old male uh, presented with TED with shortness of breath and uh, chest pain that was pleuritic in nature of sudden onset. So on examination a bit tachycardic, a bit tachypnic, SATS is a little bit low as 91% on air. I've also noticed on examination that this patient has had a midline sternotomy scar. So this is what I've uh, noticed and my impression, as you can all imagine, is going to be probably he's got pulmonary embolism. So uh, basically the D-dimer came back high and was really happy with my uh, diagnosis. So the provisional diagnosis with pulmonary embolism, the plan was to admit the patient to start low molecular weight heparin and to arrange for a CTPA. Then the surprise happened when the patient refused to take the treatment and he said that he's been advised before not to take heparin for life as he's allergic to heparin. And this was my first time ever to hear about heparin allergy. And the question now is, I've got a patient that I think has got a pulmonary embolism that needs an anticoagulation as soon as possible and he said he's allergic to heparin. What shall I do now then? So what I did was I checked the previous records for the patient first just to clarify what it means by heparin allergy and I found in the old notes something about this patient having HIT and this was my first time ever to hear about this medical condition heparin induced thrombocytopenia. So let's, uh, let's quickly go through this and, um, and see what we're gonna find. So osteoporosis and heparin induced thrombocytopenia are common side effects of heparin therapy. And actually HIT is an important life and limb threatening problem that every emergency physician should be aware of. The mortality rate is up to 20% if not treated, and it can occur with either IV heparin or subcut heparin and even the heparin flush that's used for central lines is enough to induce this condition. So really important to be aware about that. It is more in females. It is more um, above the age of 60 years old and it is more in the dark skin population. And it can be seen with heparin and with low molecular weight heparin, but it's more frequent with unfractionated heparin. So the question now is what HIT actually means. So it is a thrombocytopenia plus thrombosis. So it's a weird combination between thrombocytopenia that you would think if it happens that will cause bleeding tendency, but actually it is associated with thrombosis. And, uh, and that is all in association with heparin therapy. So thrombocytopenia as a definition is defined in this case as either the absolute number of the platelet counts to go down to below 150,000 or a platelet drop 
between uh, 30 to 50 percent after starting the heparin therapy. So if the starting platelet count was about 400 and then after heparin it's 200, although it is still above the absolute number of um, 150, but it is counted as thrombocytopenia because it's a drop by 50%. And there are two types of the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. There is type 1 and type 2. So regarding type 1, this is a non-immune mediated type and it's more common than type 2. Seen in about 10% of uh, patients receiving heparin and uh, the thrombocytopenia is not usually uh, that bad. So it's not usually below um, 100,000. Um, within the first few days of heparin therapy. And it's usually self-limiting. And um, even if you haven't stopped the heparin therapy, uh, usually things will go in the right direction. So to be honest, although it is a relatively common thing, knowing that 10% means one in every 10 patients receiving heparin, this is a lot in my head, but looking at the general picture of type 1 HIT, actually it is not that bad. Type 2 is very different. So type 2 is immune mediated, although it is less common than type 1, but actually it occurs in about 5% of patients receiving heparin. Can you imagine 5 in every 100 patients receiving heparin? If you imagine the total number of population receiving heparin, this is, a, this is a massive number. This is really scary thing to hear. So the platelet count with type 2 usually uh, is below 100,000 and it is caused by autoantibodies against platelet factor 4 that reacts with the platelets and the endothelial cells causing thrombocytopenia and endothelial damage. And thrombosis with type 2 uh, occurs in about 20% of cases. So this is a lot. So looking at this, actually, this is the type that you should be scared when you face. This is the serious one. So generally speaking, Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is not associated with bleeding. The major issue with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is thrombosis. So don't worry about the drop in platelet as a reason for bleeding. This is not the issue. It is the thrombosis that happened that causes the major issue. So how to diagnose? Diagnosis is by four T's. So remember this. The patient will be thrombocytopenic and having thrombosis and the timing is within five to 10 days of starting the heparin. And to complete your diagnosis, you need to do some special tests. And uh, they are immune ones. I don't think I'll be able to pronounce this, but this is one of the tests that are, are used to diagnose heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So remember the four T's when you think about uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia to diagnose it. Okay, what's the differential? Just think about any medical condition you know that is um, in three letters. So DIC, um, HUS, TTP, ITP, SLE. So all of them uh, can be included in the differential of the HIT, which is also three letters. So DIC, um, hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, um, immune or idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, systemic lupus erythromatosis, all these conditions can present in similar ways uh, and you should consider it in your differential here. Now we come to the interesting part, how to treat a patient who's coming to you with thrombosis that resulted from an anticoagulant drug. How are you gonna anticoagulate a patient like this? This is the big question. So to start with, treatment includes an immediate stopping of heparin. That, that is just common sense. Um, then if you uh, if you started warfarin uh, with heparin, so actually warfarin should be postponed until platelet recovery. Um, if it is uh, already started, then just give vitamin K. So uh, th this is because you've just lost the bridging uh, for warfarin. Uh, that's why you need to stop it. So the platelet transfusion actually should be avoided uh, despite the thrombocytopenia because actually it will not fix the problem. It will just increase the thrombogenic effect because you're just adding more fuel to the fire. And uh, lastly, you need to start another anticoagulant and that will be the biggest question. So what anticoagulants to use? So in America, 
uh, they use direct thrombin inhibitors. Um, I've never worked in, in America, so I'm not familiar with those ones. I'm familiar with those medications that are available in United Kingdom, which are the Danaparoid sodium. This is available in United Kingdom and in Canada, and it is a low molecular weight heparinoid um, that it can be used in, uh, in this condition, and the Fonda Paranox. So these are the different three anticoagulants that you can use for these cases. The question now is, how about Duwax? the direct oral anticoagulants, can, the, can we use them for um, HIT? Actually, the answer is yes. There is a growing evidence in the last few years uh, that DOAX can be used uh, to treat uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Actually, rivaroxaban is uh, the preferred or the one that's got the highest evidence on, uh, but apixaban and dabigatran can be also used. So discontinuation of heparin alone is not enough. This will not fix the problem. The thrombotic tendency may last for as long as 30 days after stopping heparin. So you need to start an anticoagulant for these patients. So let's go back to our patient to find out what happened. So this was a patient who had a history of heparin induced thrombocytopenia and presented with a presentation that is suggestive for a possible pulmonary embolism. So he needed to have some anticoagulation. So this patient actually received danaparoid sodium and he was admitted under the medical team for a CT pulmonary angio uh, to be done as an inpatient and further treatment. So this was the plan. I was really happy with this. It was a new learning for me to know about the danaparoid sodium. And, uh, and my plan was just uh, get a chest x-ray because that was the only thing that I haven't done for this patient yet. And, uh, and move the patient to the medical wards after having the danaparoid sodium. So chest x-ray was done uh, just before uh, leaving to the medical ward. And I just uh, had a quick look at the x-ray before moving the patient. And here is what I found. This was the chest x-ray of the patient. And when I saw this, I was like, what is this? So this was the surprise that I've had um, with this patient at the end. And uh, this will be uh, the topic for the next video. So, in summary, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is an important life and limb-threatening problem that we should all be aware of. It is thrombocytopenia plus or minus thrombosis that is associated with heparin therapy. It can occur with IV heparin, it can occur with subcutaneous heparin, and it can occur even with the heparin flush. It can be seen with heparin and low molecular weight heparin, but it is more frequent with the unfractionated heparin. There are two types of HIT, type one, which is relatively benign. Uh, type two is the bad one. So in terms of diagnosis, remember the four T's. And in terms of treatment, so immediately stop the heparin and think about a different anticoagulants. So um, in UK, you can use Danaparoid sodium, you can use the Fonda Paranox, uh, and you can consider the Duax. And the final learning point here is, please do not cherry pick your cases. It always goes wrong. And this is it regarding the second part of this case discussion. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. And in the next video, we're gonna cover the X-ray finding. Till we talk again, stay safe.